and welcome back to the poor man's chemist in this video I wanted to change gears a lot um, and it's just for this one video I promise this is not going to be a regular thing but it's something I wanted to touch on for a long time just because it's something that I actually know quite a bit about and it relates to chemistry and that it is the history of chemistry and that is alchemy um, I wanted to talk about alchemy as a system, as a theory, um, in the way that it was the alchemical theory of matter predated the chemical theory of matter. If you don't have an atomic theory of matter, alchemy makes a lot of sense, and the premises that it's built on do. Now, I'm not talking about all of the spiritual hoo-ha that, you know, is associated with it. I'm talking about laboratory alchemy. The actual laboratory process is carried out based on alchemical theory and the alchemical theory of matter. Um, so, I mean, it, it, these days, it's almost like mainstream chemists just don't care. It's like this is just totally glossed over. If there's any mention of alchemy at all, it's almost always, oh, those charlatans are trying to turn, you know, lead into gold. That's not what it was at all. And then you have the New Age people who think, you know, oh, it's all about personal transformation, yeah. No, I'm sorry, okay? The, the entire occult theory <laughs> and mindset was taken over by a bunch of psychologists, you know, in the um, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in the late 1800s. And since they saw everything through the lens of psychology, they decided that alchemical textbooks that they could not understand must be all psychological allegory. No, that's not true. <laughs> these these books describe real laboratory processes because these people were get in, they wanted to get real practical results. Um, so you know, I mean, I think it does them a great disservice to just forget everything. And a lot of old chemistry textbooks will start making a lot more sense, especially some of like the archaic language. If you start understanding where chemistry came from and what it grew out of, I mean, even Isaac Newton, most of his work was done with alchemy, because that was the prevailing chemical theory of the day. Um, you know, I mean, now, let's just get it, you know, right out of the way, you know, from the word go. No, the Philosopher's Stone is not real. Um, and I can prove it to you. Um, nobody has ever been able to transform lead into gold using alchemy. Now, if you're a chemist, you're sitting there going, of fucking course they haven't. But you would be amazed at the number of people who think that this thing can be done somehow by some kind of magic thing. No. Um, here's your proof, okay? If you converted lead or antimony into gold, the nuclear reactions that would be involved would give off so much radiation it would kill the person I mean especially if you know it was you know like you've heard in the myths you know kilograms of gold that would be I mean you think about it you're turning lead into gold so you've create basically your magic substance has created an isotope of lead that will decay into gold within a matter of minutes or hours that means it has you basically created this radioactive substance that has an incredibly short half-life, meaning it is just violently <laughs> radioactive. I mean, its own internal heat just from the decay would probably liquefy and boil the fucker. Um, and it would absolutely kill the alchemist. So, that's not a thing. <laughs> But let's talk for a minute about the alchemical theory of matter and why they thought it was a thing. The alchemical theory of matter worked like this. So we're all familiar with the four elements, right? Earth, air, fire, and water. Well, according to the alchemical view of it, um, everything was made from these things, yet you could not isolate them in their pure form. 
So even a fire wouldn't be like a bonfire, wouldn't be pure fire. There's the smoke, you know, all my fellow chemists out there know if you were to some put a cold surface over that fire, water vapor would start condensing on it. So you've got your water, you've got the ashes, you've got your earth there. So it, it was impossible to isolate them. However, they could be isolated in pairs. And these led, this theory leads to the three principles. So you have earth and water combining to form the salt of a thing. The salt is the body of a thing. Then you, I will explain, just bear with me here. Then you have air and water that combine to form the mercury of a thing. This is the life force, the, the life essence of the material. Then you have air and fire that combine to form the sulfur of the thing, which is its soul. Um, I know, chemicals don't have a soul. Just, again, I'm explaining it from, you know, the perspective of the alchemical theory of matter, alright? Now, in alchemy, you have three kingdoms. Vegetable, animal, and mineral. What alchemists would do is they would take something, let's take the vegetable world since it's the one, you know, for which there are a lot of practical application and a lot of good did come out of this. Um, because some plants do have a medicinal value, as we all know. Um, so what they would do, say we're going to take one that's, I don't know, let's take a good one that everybody will be interested in. Say you took cannabis or kratom. Um, any of these things, and you wanted to prepare the alchemical medicine from this plant material. Well, in the alchemical, well, the way, what alchemists would do is they would say, okay, we need to extract the salt, sulfur, and mercury from this material, isolate them, purify them, and then recombine them to form a more elevated alchemical body of the thing in question. So if we took cannabis, say, what we would do is we would take some cannabis buds, let's make it the happy part, and we would steam distill these fuckers to get all of the oil out of them. It'd be some good hash. Um, <laughs> so anyway, we've got that, okay? We've got the oil out of it. Then we would take, that is the sulfur. That is the soul of the plant. You with me? Um, anybody that smokes hash will probably agree with me. Um, so anyway, so then we take the plant material that we steam distilled and we let it ferment. Now this will give us our mercury, which in the vegetable world is always ethanol, or it's acetic acid. You have the volatile mercury and the fixed mercury. There are two kinds of mercury. Um, the fixed mercury is acetic acid, the other product of fermentation. Um, so, you know, I mean, but you can see the difference. Alcohol is volatile, ethanol. Um, acetic acid, not as volatile. So, that's where this all comes from. Now, the salt would be, what you would do is you would take this poor abused plant material that you <laughs> steam distilled and then fermented the shit out of it. Um, and then you would take it and you would dry it out and you would burn it down to a fine ash. Then you would extract that ash with water um, and filter it. Whatever didn't dissolve was called the terra damnata, the damned earth. I've always liked that one. Um, or the kaput mortem, the deadhead. That one's pretty cool, too. Um, in a lot of alchemical texts, you will see it described as, and no joke, the feces. <laughs> And like feces, you know, what do you think you do with that? You discard it. Um, then you would take your solution, you would filter it, you know, to make sure you got all that crap out of it that wouldn't dissolve. Um, and then you would evaporate that solution down and that would leave you with the soluble salts from the plant. Um, mostly potassium carbonate. And then you would have the salt of the plant. And then you would take these three things and you would recombine them together. And then that would give you the elevated alchemical body of cannabis. You with me?
Um, old herbal medicines always would have the plant salts. So, I mean, they probably did help people because they gave them a good dose of potassium. Um, you know, I, I don't doubt that it was helpful for people, especially, you know, living hundreds of years ago where nutrition was, you know, kind of hit or miss a lot of the time. Um, you know, you have the plant oils, which very well could contain medicinal compounds, and the alcohol, which, you know, acted as a delivery agent. Now, alchemists would extend this to the other kingdom. Now, why are we skipping the animal kingdom? That's a Great question. Um, mostly because it's horrifying. When you start getting up into stuff like the mineral kingdom, you do a lot of dry distillation. I, I don't want to be, yeah, I mean, can you imagine, and probably some human has at some point dry distilled some poor mouse. That's horrifying. That's, not nah, that's beyond unethical. That's cruel. And if anybody that would do that is a fucking asshole. Um... <clears throat> I wouldn't do that to an earthworm. But, anywho, um, I mean, or with blood, uh, probably. I don't know. A lot of textbooks don't even touch this subject. Even the old ones don't. Um, you know, thank God for that. <laughs> People hundreds of years ago probably shared our revulsion to it. Although, again, I'm sure some human being has done it, because there's always some human being that has done every godforsaken thing. Anywho, the Mineral Kingdom. This is like where we get into the turning metals to gold. So, again, they would think, the alchemists would think that all metals had a salt, sulfur, and mercury, just like plants did. And they would do all kinds of stuff with it. Um, a lot of it involved dry distilling the acetates of the metals. So you would, you know, take some sample of, say, like lead, and then you would combine it with vinegar, and um, then you would create lead acetate out of this. Then you would take your nice crystalline lead acetate that you busted your ass making out of fucking vinegar that you got, you know, you made yourself, and lead that you got from who knows where, from ore. Um, a lot of the times alchemists would work with ore. So this was no small feat, man. <laughs> I mean, fuck. Then they would take this and they would dry distill it, okay? then this would, uh, they would always describe the process as going like this. And I've never done it before. It, I guess it might be interesting to do it just to see what the hell it looks like. Um, but when you dry distill metal acetates, apparently you will get some water, of course, the water of crystallization. Then you will get, um, it will, the entire distillation apparatus will fill with a white smoke. And then you will start getting droplets of a blood red oil. I mean, a lot of textbooks describe this. Um, some of the, you know, older alchemical textbooks will dress this up in all kinds of fancy language. You know, the blood of the lion and eagles flying and who knows what. A lot of it is tied to astrology. Astrology figures very big into old alchemy, like very big. <laughs> um, so, anyway... You would take your, you know, the oil that was produced by this. Um, interesting historical note, this dry distillation of metal acetates was a method used for producing acetone. It was the first industrial method used to produce acetone. So we know that, you know, some portion of your product is going to be acetone. Um, then they would take these things, and an alchemist had this thing where they would... Um, recombine things. So they would distill something, recombine it. Distill, recombine. Distill, recombine. Um, this is an operation that could have been done to it. I mean, there, there's... I don't know. It's been a while since I've actually read these books, y'all. But you would take these various things that you would get, and then these would produce the various alchemical medicines. There is a guy who wrote a book where he made a lot of these things and then subjected the products to like a GCMS analysis, I think it was, or was it HPLC, I don't recall. But anyway, he found that it was a lot of um, this dry distillation process, you know, these oils of the various metals contain a lot of low molecular weight, it looked like ketones and various other compounds like that. Their medicinal value is questionable. 
I mean, it was always a witch's brew of a numerous compounds. Um, so, you know, yeah. And as for recombining it, well, I don't know, man. I mean, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Now, the Philosopher's Stone, though, would very much so have been an, a, a matter of digestion, distillation, recombination. Um, the reason that Mercury fairy figured bigly in all of this is because Mercury was seen as the Mercury of the Mineral Kingdom, just like ethanol and acetic acid are the Mercury of the Vegetable Kingdom metallic mercury, elemental mercury, was the mercury of the mineral kingdom, the literal life's essence of it. <laughs> they would distill it over and over because in alchemy you can imbue the various occult influences that are at work during whatever time you're doing it by vaporizing a thing. When things are in a gaseous state, they are imprinted with sublime influences that are at work. This is where astrology comes in, the days of the week, the hours of the day or of the night, um, and they would do it not by just hours, it was broken down into planetary hours where you take the amount of time from sunrise to sunset and then you divide that up into 12 hours, hours, you know, 12 sections, and however long that is, that is a planetary hour. And the, you have a planet that rules a given day, it's pretty obvious as to which ones do what, um, especially if you speak French, and there you have, now you know where the names of the days of the week come from. Um, but, and you also had planetary rulers within the different hours. So, like, if you're making an alchemical extract of rosemary, well then you, since rosemary was associated with the sun for whatever reason, you would harvest it and do a lot of your operations during the day and hour of the sun where the power of the sun was at maximum influence. <laughs> um, again, like I said, there was a lot of spiritual nonsense tied to it. Even though it was a practical laboratory operation that produced an actual product. And if you follow their instructions, you generally do get the products they describe. Uh, do they have the magical properties they say they do? No. <laughs> no. Um, but, I mean, you do get what they talk about. Um, and, I mean, there's lots of examples of this. Um, but when you look at mineral alchemy, one reason that they thought that you could turn metals like lead into gold is because you can change the appearance of a metal depending on how it's cast. So copper, you can work with it and then cast it in such a way that it comes out looking kind of silvery like any other metal. Or it will turn the normal coppery color we're all fami familiar with. Um, I mean, it's not the only metal that does this. You can get different metals, you know, to have different appearances. And so they thought that it was just a matter of figuring out how you get lead to turn into gold. Um, this is also based on the way, you know, ores were discovered. I mean, you would have certain ores found in association with each other, um, and the alchemists thought, based on this, that one metal was changing into another slowly over time in the earth, and that everything was evolving towards gold because gold was the most perfect metal. And I mean, if you look at gold, it does have some remarkable properties in the fact that, you know, it's unreactive, it, it you know, maintains a beautiful golden shine, yada, 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 um, actually melts at a fairly high temperature. You don't think so. Everybody says gold melts at a low temperature, but until you actually try to melt some, it takes a pretty decent temp to melt gold. Um, I mean, you know, and, and if you compare lead and gold, it sure is, again, don't have an atomic theory of matter. You're just looking at these two lumps of metal. You know that these metals are, you know, these ores are found together. You know that you can make metals change their appearance depending on things you do with them in the lab. 
it's not a great leap to think that then, okay, well then, what do I need to do to this lead to get it, convince it to turn into gold? And again, you have mercury that figured very big into everything because it was thought, you know, you need to somehow imbue the lead with more life force. The, the, the alchemists just thought that they were taking what was naturally happening in the earth and speeding it up. That's all that they were trying to do. And again, they had good reason to think that that was possible until the atomic theory of matter came along and explained to us why that's not possible. Rather, it is possible, but it requires nuclear reactions to make that happen. In a way, the alchemists were right. Gold is pure and perfect. It is its own thing. And, you know, they, they just had no idea that so was everything else. <laughs> Um, you know, nowadays we, we know better, but that's only because many great scientists, men and women that have, you know, have continued to try to figure out how the universe actually works and what it's actually built off of, have continued to work at it. We are building on their work. They're, they're not a bunch of fakes and people that should be looked down upon. And modern-day alchemists are people that, you know, I've talked to them. I don't disrespect them. I do try to explain to them why the whole creating gold out of other stuff is simply not going to happen. And, you know, why, if it did, it would kill them. So they probably shouldn't be going after that. And as for the Philosopher's Stone creating the elixir of life, which this is a real thing. This is not just Harry Potter. This is real alchemical lore. I'm sorry, y'all. It just doesn't happen. It's not a thing. I mean, not unless the Philosopher's Stone is some conglomeration of little, like, you know, nanobots from the far future that you can then, you know, take a little bit of, and then, you know, like, Doctor Who level shit, you know, they just fix you forever. Maybe then. <laughs> Maybe whoever invents that one day will make it some red, waxy-looking stuff so that it can match, you know, the descriptions, and, and they'll market it as that. You'd probably make a mint. So anyway, um, this has been my, you know, little foray into the history of chemistry. Um, I love the old archaic stuff. It really is fascinating. Um, you know, you, you shouldn't just dismiss it. I mean, remember, these were people that were making chemicals at home out of dirt and rotting shit. I mean, that's pretty goddamn amazing. And if you can do that shit, and make the basics for yourself. Because remember how they were discovered. I mean, they, you can do DIY everything from the ground up. And a study of laboratory alchemy basically teaches you all the processes you need to do that. Along with the tricks and tips assembled by fucking thousands of people over hundreds of years. You ignore it to your detriment. <laughs> you want chemicals off the books, my friends. Well, you know, once you have acetic acid, you can basically do anything. You can start from things from fermentation, my friends. And, I mean, hey, some any old plant calcine down will give you potassium carbonate. Now you have an acid and a base. That's all you need. You can start from there. Solvents, well, you can start with ethanol. You've got water. You've got acetic acid. You see what I mean? There, the, there's a lot of self-sufficiency to be learned there. You know, I mean, we've all seen what COVID-19 can do to slow down civilization. Imagine if this disease had a mortality rate of 10% or 20%. Or 30%, like smallpox. Yeah. Civilization would unravel before your fucking eyes. Now, somebody like me, that depends on daily medication for, you know, HIV, would not last long. Once I can no longer get my meds, ah, uh, well, it'll be a year or two before the virus fucking destroys my immune system and then... The common cold will fucking kill me. 
or something really horrifying like a fungal infection. Yeah, that's oh god, uh, rotting while you're still alive. Oh god, yeah, I would um, no, that's okay. Um, <laughs> I also know how to make cyanide out of scratch, so <laughs> there's a way out. Not that, not that. Although I, you know, although disease is my preferred way of checking out. At least you have time to come to terms with things, even if it's just a matter of days, you know? You can... okay. You can have your last hurrah, too, if it's something like cancer where it's long and drawn out. You know, trust me, I know all about turning chemo into a party. <laughs> you might as well live it up, bitches, because it's the end, you know? But anyway... I, I don't even know how I got off onto that. That, that is, I, I don't even, this cannot go on to YouTube. <laughs> Anywho, I hope you've enjoyed this little foray into the history of chemistry and the little detour into my slightly demented mind. If you enjoyed this, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, I totally understand. It's not my normal thing. Give it a thumbs down. You know, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I would like your honest opinion. So, I mean, you know... Give it a thumbs down. It's not, you know, you don't have to do a loyalty thumbs up. Really, it's okay. Um, leave your comments. You know, let me know what you think. Um, I don't have any plans on doing another one of these. This is just a one-off. I, I just, something I've wanted to talk about for a while. And, um, you know, I mean, telling you about my cancer story seemed to go off well. So I figured I would sit down and try to do this and, you know, talk to y'all, share some knowledge that I've accumulated over the years. You would be amazed at the fucking things I know. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you so much for your continued support. Everybody, viewers, subscribers, donors, all of y'all, you fucking rock. And I appreciate each and every single fucking one of you. I really do. So, until the next one, y'all, I will see you later.